Are you taking the SAT soon? Do you need to know more about SAT grammar rules? Don't worry, I got your back. Hi everyone, I'm Jason Patel, the founder of Transition, and we've helped thousands of students prepare for the SAT and ACT. Now I'm looking forward to helping you. Before getting started, please press subscribe if you're interested in more videos on college and career topics. Our videos cover everything from college essays to test prep to becoming a successful professional. In this video, I cover important SAT grammar rules, how to prepare for the SAT, and examples of these SAT grammar rules in action. SAT grammar rules, there are so many. Don't worry, this video guide covers everything you need to know. The SAT tests your ability in three main areas, reading, mathematics, and writing. That means writing makes up over 30% of your score. And if you decide to complete the optional essay section, it becomes even more important. A lot of students tend to overlook writing when they prepare for the SAT. They focus more on reading and mathematics, drilling vocabulary words, and practicing math problems. Don't make this mistake. Remember, all three sections are equally important. And if you think that the other two sections are easier to study for, think again. In this video guide, I'm providing a list of the grammar rules you need to know for the SAT writing and language test. Using the list that I provide, along with the examples and tips that I've included, you can brush up on grammar and boost your writing and language score. And of course, your overall score too. About the writing and language test. As the College Board explains, you have three main tasks on the writing and language test. Read, find mistakes and weaknesses, and fix them. Basically, you're being asked to proofread and edit. All questions on the writing and language test are passage-based and multiple choice. Within the passages, you'll correct words and sentences, or if there is no error, you'll select no change. For questions based on science passages, you may have to choose a sentence that more accurately represents the data provided in a table or another graphic. Here's a tip. It may be tempting to read only the sentences you're asked to correct. However, context is important for many of the questions in this section. It's best to read the passage first, then answer the questions. If time is an issue for you, try to at least skim the passage before you tackle any questions. Writing and language questions cover five main topics. Command of evidence, words and context, analysis and history, and social studies and science, expression of ideas, and standard English conventions. Grammar rules for the writing and language test. Like I said in this video guide, I'm gonna focus on the standard English conventions. The College Board describes conventions as the building blocks of writing. This includes topics like comma use, parallel construction, subject verb agreement, and verb tense. If you're wondering, what's that? Don't panic, I've got you covered. All right, so let's take a look at the grammar rules you'll need to know. The rules I've included in this video are based on the College Board's official study guide for their writing and language test. For each rule, I'm gonna provide an example and some strategies you can use to sharpen your skills in this area. Number one. Sentence structure. Recognizing and correcting sentence formation problems and inappropriate shifts in sentence construction. Rule one, a complete sentence, also known as an independent clause, must have a subject and a verb, and it must express a complete thought. A clause is a group of words that includes a subject and a verb. There are two types of clauses, independent clauses and dependent clauses. Independent clauses can stand on their own as a sentence, hence independent. To function independently, they must have a subject and a verb, and they must express a complete thought. Without these three elements, you have a fragment instead of a complete sentence. On the SAT, you'll be asked to recognize and correct incomplete sentences. Okay, here's an example. The incorrect example is a fragment. Although it does contain a subject, she, and a verb, ran, it does not offer a complete thought. To fix this fragment, we need to complete the thought. We could say something like, because she ran, she managed to catch the bus in time. Now that's a sentence. Here are some strategies. When you read informal writing like social media posts and text messages, you'll likely encounter a lot of fragments. And that's okay. Practice identifying them and recognizing what makes them fragments. What is missing? How could you fix a fragment and complete the sentence? Come up with a mnemonic device to remember the three elements of a sentence. Subject, verb, and complete thought. What could the letters NVC stand for? For instance, Sarah vacuums carpets or Sam values C. Pick something that's easy for you to remember. Rule number two. When combining two independent clauses, you must use either a semicolon or a comma 
with a coordinating conjunction. Otherwise, the sentence is a run-on. You know that independent clauses are complete sentences that can stand alone. That's why they're independent, as I mentioned before. And as I mentioned earlier, these clauses contain a subject, a verb, and a complete thought. You can combine the complete clauses into longer sentences, but there are rules you must follow when doing so. There are two acceptable ways to combine independent clauses. You can link the clauses with a semicolon, or you can use a comma and a coordinating conjunction. The seven coordinating conjunctions are and, but, for, nor, or, so, yet. If you don't follow these rules, you have a run-on sentence, and that's a grammatical no-no. Sometimes students confuse run-on sentences with really long sentences. That's not necessarily true. Regardless of length, a sentence is a run-on sentence when two independent clauses are squished together in a way that is not grammatically correct. Here's an example. Continue practicing your mnemonic device for complete sentences and independent clauses. Your ability to recognize an independent clause is crucial to identifying run-on sentences. Another trick to recognize a run-on sentence is to see whether there is more than one complete thought in the sentence you are reading. If so, are there two ideas separated by a semicolon or a comma and a coordinating conjunction? If not, it's likely a run-on that needs to be corrected. Remember that the length of a sentence does not determine whether it's a run-on. It's a run-on if two independent clauses are fused together without the correct punctuation. Okay, rule number three. When independent clauses are combined using a comma, a coordinating conjunction is also required. Otherwise, it's a comma splice. One specific type of run-on sentence is a comma splice. A comma splice occurs when two independent clauses are connected with a comma and no coordinating conjunction. Here's an example. I love tacos is an independent clause because it contains a subject, a verb, and a complete thought. I would eat them every day if I could is an independent clause for the same reason. To combine these two independent clauses with a comma, we must also use a coordinating conjunction, like and. Here are strategies. Use the comma fanboys to remember your coordinating conjunctions. For and nor, but or yet so. Fanboys. Consider using flashcards as you practice grammar. On the front of one card, write coordinating conjunctions. On the back, list all the coordinating conjunctions and practice naming them. Rule number four, understand the difference between coordinating and subordinating conjunctions and when to use them. Conjunctions are sometimes called joiners because they join two sentences together. There are two types of conjunctions, coordinating conjunctions and subordinating conjunctions. Coordinating conjunctions link an independent clause to another independent clause. Subordinating conjunctions link a dependent clause to an independent clause. Dependent clauses are a type of sentence fragment. They contain a subject and a verb, but do not form a complete thought. Dependent clauses must be linked to independent clauses to form complete sentences. They cannot stand alone. Subordinating conjunctions signal a cause and effect relationship between the two clauses, or they indicate a shift in time and place. Here are examples of subordinating conjunctions. Although, after, as, before, because, by the time, even if, even though, if, until, unless, since, wherever, while. On the SAT, you may be asked to find errors with subordination and coordination. For example, you may need to recognize issues like a coordinating conjunction being used when the sentence logically calls for a subordinating conjunction instead. Here's an example. Strategies. Remember that two independent clauses need a coordinating conjunction. A dependent clause that is linked to an independent clause requires a subordinating conjunction. Print or write a list of subordinating conjunctions and familiarize yourself with them. You do not need to attempt to memorize all of these, although some students choose to memorize nine of the most common subordinating conjunctions using the mnemonic a white bus. A white bus. Note that these words do not function only as subordinating conjunctions. Most of them can be used as prepositions or adverbs. 
They are subordinating conjunctions when followed by a subject and verb. Rule number five, parallel structure means that elements of a sentence that are alike in function must also be alike in structure. Parallel structure requires you to use consistent form throughout a sentence. You must use parallel structure in various situations, including the following. With two elements that are joined by a coordinating conjunction, with elements that appear in a list or series, when comparing two elements. Here's your example. When words are joined by and, or, or, check to see if the words on either side are parallel. If you read sentences, listen for parallel structure. Are you hearing the same sounds, like for example, ing at the end of words? Is there a rhythm to the sentence? If something breaks the rhythm or the repetition, check to see if it needs to be made parallel. Okay, rule number six. In order to avoid confusion, modifiers should be placed close to the noun they modify. Modifiers are words, phrases, or clauses that add explanation, emphasis, or detail to a sentence. They're typically descriptive words or phrases, and they are generally placed right next to the word they're describing. For instance, consider the sentence, Mr. Barnhart, the principal, knew the name of every student in the building. In this sense, the principal is a modifier. It modifies the noun, Mr. Barnhart, by adding more detail. If you refer to a red hat, red is a modifier providing more detail about the hat. Sometimes modifiers are misplaced. A misplaced modifier occurs when the modifier is too far away from the noun it modifies, causing confusion and sometimes unintentional humor. Here's your example. As you can see, misplaced modifiers appear to modify the wrong word. It looks like the sister's name is Socks, which would be kind of funny. When you move the modifier closer to the noun it is meant to modify, the sentence becomes much clearer. All right, so here are some strategies. When looking for misplaced modifiers, ask yourself if there is any way the sentence could be misinterpreted. If there is, it's helpful to move the modifier closer to the noun it modifies. If you're correcting a misplaced modifier, move it as close to the noun it modifies as possible. 